Right, let me take the opportunity of welcoming everybody here today. It's a very, very wet, miserable afternoon, but we're very pleased that you've come along for the preaching of the gospel. We're going to open the meeting with hymn number one on your hymn sheet. There will never be a sweeter story, story of the Saviour's love divine, love that brought him from realms of glory just to save a sinful soul like mine. Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful, 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 wasn't the love of Jesus something wonderful, wonderful it is to me? We'll sing the first two verses on the course of hymn number one. There will never be a sweeter story, story of the Savior's love divine, love that brought him from the realms of just to save a sinful soul like mine. Is the love of Jesus something wonderful? speaks about the wonderful love of the Lord Jesus Christ. The next hymn is on the same theme. It's more of a question, but it says, what kind of love is this that gave himself for me? And there is something, dear friend, about the love of Jesus that is beyond our comprehension. Even the Apostle Paul, he writes to believers, to, he tells them about knowing the love of Jesus which passes knowledge. And there's something about it we cannot really explain, nor scale the heights of, nor plumb the depths of. And this second hymn is on that theme. What kind of love is this that gave itself for me? I am the guilty one, yet I go free. What kind of love is this? A love I've never known. I didn't even know his name. What kind of love is this? Again, we'll sing the first two verses of hymn number two. in that hymn as well. <clears throat> now the reason this meeting has been convened is that you would get to know the love of the Lord Jesus and you would get to know this man uh, who, who we've been singing about. So we trust and pray that uh, as our brother proclaims the gospel a little later here that you would get to know the one 
we have been singing about. Now, for our speaker today, we have our brother Roland Pickering, Roland Pickering with us again. He's been here before, and we trust that uh, he will get help as he would proclaim the message of the gospel. And then next Lord's Day, in God's will, we'll have the meeting again at the same time, and the speaker expected is uh, Thomas Waltz. So you'll remember that meeting as well. Now, as is our custom, we're going to speak to God in prayer, but there's some names that we would like you to remember in prayers, in your own personal prayers, and we'll just read them out. Uh, some will be familiar to you. Uh, you could think of Jim Wallace, and May Farr, Roy Campbell, Martha Douglas, Brenda Holmes, Rhoda Newell, Heather Allett, Linda Sharp, Clay McCullough, James Cunningham, Janet Bingham, and Raymond Clements. These are all people that um, are going through difficult times and are in need of prayers. And then there's families who have lost loved ones in recent days. There's the family of Austin Alexander and the family of Mrs. Wayne McCartan. These families too could uh, know something of our prayers, just that they would be comforted in their time of loss. Now, just before we hand the meeting over to our brother Roland, we'll speak to God in prayer. Our Father, we bow humbly again in thy holy presence. We do so in that precious name, the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're thankful again, our Father, for thy goodness to us. Thou has been good to us in so many ways, even as a people and a nation that has been good to us. We have the word of God in our own mother tongue, a privilege that is beyond estimation, just to have thy message to us in our own mother tongue. Thou has brought us into a land where the freedom to preach the gospel is still available. We're thankful for this. It's a land favoured above many. And our Father, even this area, is a favoured spot in that land for the preaching of the gospel. We could come a bit closer, and thou hast been good to us individually, even with the matter of health and strength and soundness of mind that enables us just to gather together today. We're thankful for thy hand upon us, and we give thee our heartfelt thanks. And now, our Father, we would look to thee for thy help in the proclamation of the gospel. It is thy message to mankind. It is thy message to the individual. And we pray, our God, this afternoon, here at Riverside Farm, as the message will go forth, that thou would bless it to some dear soul. We trust and pray that someone would listen today as for eternity that they would drink in the message of the gospel. They would turn away from sin and turn to the only one that can meet their need, the blessed Saviour, our Lord Jesus Christ. Give our brother help as he opens thy precious word and makes known the gospel, and we pray a like blessing on whenever thy word is preached today and the Saviour is set forth as the only remedy for man's ruin. We leave all these things in thy care, and we ask it in our Saviour's Precious name. Amen. And the meeting over the room. Well, we're glad to be here this afternoon just to help a little in the preaching of the gospel. And to do that, I want to read a verse, just one verse. You'll find it in Luke's gospel in chapter 23. Probably well-known words to many. Verse 33, Luke chapter 23 and verse 33 it says and when they were come to the place which is called Calvary there they crucified him and the malefactors one on the right hand and the other on the left. Now that's all we read with the Lord's blessing. We have read about a place the name of the place is called Calvary. We live in a world where people like to visit places.
places. I know that over COVID that was greatly restricted, but in recent months travel has resumed and people are visiting different places in the world, historic places, outstanding places, places of meaning, and so on. I want us just for a few minutes in mind and heart to visit this place that we have read about, the place which is called Calvary. And I want you to think about some things that are very important about that place. The first one lies on the surface. It was a place of crucifixion. That term, that thought, crucifixion, the very mention of it speaks terror because it was a terrible death for a person to die. It was the form of execution that the Romans used. They tell us it was invented by the Phoenicians and perfected by the Romans. It is said that the death of crucifixion, a person died a thousand deaths. Well, this is what our verse tells us regarding our Lord Jesus Christ. There they crucified him. You know, this afternoon we have to stop at this place and ask ourselves the question, why was he there? What was it for? And the reality is, that he was there for you and for me. You see, the Bible says that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. The reality is that in him there was no sin, and thus there was no cause of death in him. And yet the marvel is that the Lord Jesus, who was not liable to death as we all are, yet he was capable of death. And the wonder is, Charles Wesley wrote about it in his hymn, "'Tis mystery all the immortal dies, who can explore his strange designs. So Calvary was a place of crucifixion. Its location was outside the city of Jerusalem. You know, my dear friend, this afternoon I want to impress upon your heart that the Lord Jesus went outside to bring us inside. He came down to bring us up. It was all for us. It was all for your eternal blessing. And I wonder, has it ever really reached right down into your heart the great truth that I am the sinner that Christ died for? So Calvary... It was a place of crucifixion, but it was a place of compassion. If we had read further down the chapter, we would hear his words when he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You see, the heart of Christ that reached out even to those of his captors. They had no compassion on him, but he had compassion on them. And that word that came from his lips, they tell us 
they were repeated a number of times. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. In other words, he was saying, Father, hold back the judgment that they deserve and let it fall on me. You see, he became a substitute there at Calvary, there on the cross. He stepped into the breach. He stepped into the place of judgment that should have fallen on you and me. And he bore the punishment and he bore the judgment that was deserving to me a guilty sinner. The wonder of the gospel. He took my place and died for me. Oh friend this evening Isaac Watts he wrote those words Love so amazing, so divine, demands my heart, my life, my all. What love is this we've been singing about? A love, its length, its breadth, its depth, its height. My, we could never tell it, explain it in its completeness. It is like a mighty ocean that has no shoreline the hymn writer said like shoreless seas thy love can know no bound thou lovest me I want to tell you this evening that the Savior that we present in the gospel that he loves your soul that he longs that you might be free and forgiven of your sin he longs that you might not Continue on that broad, uncrowded road that leads to destruction, as the Lord Jesus said. He longs today that there might be a heart that would respond and say, I am coming, Lord, coming now to thee, trusting only in the blood that flowed on Calvary. Here we are this afternoon. What a great privilege just to hear again the entreaty of the cross, to hear again the welcome of Calvary. We trust that there might be a response in the heart of a boy or girl, a man or woman today. You have heard the message here Sunday after Sunday. You know it so well. You have not only heard it here, but in many other places. And as yet, you have never taken that step. You have never come to that point where you realize, I need this, and I want this, and I'll take this, and I'll have this. I trust that someone today might choose Christ and choose life. Calvary was a place of compassion in the lamentations we read it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not I'll tell you this the compassionate Christ in his life was compassionate in his death and the Savior who lifted, who healed, who helped, who blessed men and women. My, he finally paid the ultimate price on the cross. When he gave his life, when he shed his blood. Calvary, what a place. A place of crucifixion. A place of compassion. But let me remind you. It became a place of crisis. We didn't read it, but you'll find it further down the chapter. The two malefactors, the one on either side. And one of those malefactors, my, as time ticked away, 
he turned to the other criminal and he said, We indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man had done nothing amiss. He said to the other man, he said, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? I'll tell you, those two malefactors, they neither feared man nor God. They didn't care about anything. That's why they were there, because of their crimes, because of what they had done. But one of those things, he came to realize, my that here was someone on the cross hanging beside him and he came to a point where he realized I need Christ. It's a great thing when a person comes to that crisis in their life. You say, what is a crisis? It very simply means a decisive time. You see, you have to decide for Christ. You, you don't just drift into heaven. Nobody, as it were, somehow just arrives in heaven. The reality is you don't get to heaven by chance. You get to heaven when you make a choice. And you've got to choose Christ. For he is the way, the truth, and the life. He said, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. And so here's a man, one of the malefactors. He's in a crisis. You see, the, re, the, the, the brevity of his life came before him. The reality of Eternity came before him. Sometimes you hear people say that you don't know what's round the corner. And we know what people mean when they say that. None of us know what's round the corner. Well, I want to tell you about this man that day on the cross. For him, there were no more corners to go round. He was facing eternity head on, straight in front of him. He knew that in a few hours his body would be taken down from that cross, limp in death, and be thrown into the valley of Gehenna. And he knew my that eternity was right up in front of him. He had gone round the last corner and now he was facing eternity. I'll tell you, friend, when a person comes to terms with the reality of their sin and the brevity of life and the destinies of eternity, they are in a crisis. I trust that God will speak into some heart, some soul this afternoon. That you might be awakened to realize that your life is passing. And who knows my when your lease and my lease on time will run out. The Bible says... It is but a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. I wonder today if someone would have a crisis right here. But as I close, Calvary was a place of crucifixion, a place of compassion, a place of crisis. But Calvary became a place of conversion. You know that thief? He turned to the Lord Jesus. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest in thy kingdom. That cry from that man 
He says, remember me. It simply means count me in. Don't forget about me. He's really saying, in a sense, if all Jerusalem forgets about me, Lord, don't forget about me. I want to be in. Do you want to be in? Because I'll tell you this, when it comes to the end of the road, you'll either be in or out. You'll either be up or down. You'll either be with Christ or without Christ. You'll either be in heaven or in hell. And there's no in between. And there's no limbo. And there's no soul sleep. Get rid of all those notions. They're not in your Bible. Oh, the reality is, this man, from his heart, he said, Lord, remember me, count me in when thou comest in thy kingdom. And here's what he heard. Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Could you get anything better than that? Today, how soon shalt thou, how sure, be with me, how sweet, in paradise, how special. I'll tell you today, no wonder the hymn writer said, take the world but give me Jesus, all its joys are but a name, but thy love abideth ever through eternal years the same. Ladies and gentlemen, this afternoon, ere you leave, what about your soul? What about the Savior? Oh, for a crisis in some heart. Oh, for a conversion to God today. You see, the thief said, Remember me. And the Lord replied, You'll be with me. What pardon? What forgiveness? Who is a pardoning God like thee? Or who is grace? So rich and free, when they were come to the place which is called Calvary there, they crucified him. He died, he was buried, he rose, he ascended, he's exalted, he's coming soon. Be also ready, he said, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Oh, for a conversion to God. This afternoon shall we pray. Our God and Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we give thee thanks for this opportunity just to speak about Calvary and to point souls to the Savior. We long that there might be someone converted today, someone brought to Christ. We commend thy word to thee. And pray for blessing in thy precious name. Amen. Thank you for coming and listening. And may the Lord bless his word to your hearts.